Listen, there are a lot of DIY panel videos on YouTube. We know this isn't quite original, but we had to do something to this room and then fell into a rabbit hole. So today we're discussing sound panels and we're making them a little bit special. We're making art. Ah, you see, you might not have guessed that this was a sound panel or art, but it is both. There are a few other dual purpose uses for filmmakers I can think of as well. So let's talk about all we learned during this process and then we'll show you how to make them too. Before proceeding, I would like to remind you that your sound goals might be different than ours. We just want to reduce the echo and to improve the sound quality of our videos. We do talking presentations, not music or singing. So let's start off with the materials needed to make one of these. There are three essential parts to the build, the frame, the insulation, and the cover. For the frame, we decided to use MDF wooden planks. These are 1x3x8 feet long MDF boards, with the actual dimensions of 0.65 by 25 inches. Woodboard's actual dimensions are never what they're named for. Something about losing material in the last finishing steps. Anyway, we chose these for their affordable price, mostly, and, well, their ideal dimensions, at least aesthetically, in my opinion. In theory, the thicker the better. In fact, some people recommend having some space between the absorption material and the wall. However, anything sticking out of the wall more than this, I'd say is not worth the exponentially less significant improvement. Next, the insulation slash absorption material. There's a lot of conflicting information on what material is best. Here's what I've been able to gather. Sound control is a blanket term for sound isolation and sound absorption. Sound absorption is the phenomenon where non-solid materials absorb sound waves and attenuate them. If your recording space is loud from outside noise, this won't help you that much. There are better solutions. Sound isolation is similar, but its focus is not on letting the sound waves go through the material at all. So if your room has a lot of external noise, this is the type of treatment you'd want. However, good noise isolation is difficult to achieve and beyond the scopes of this video. High density materials are good isolators. Concrete, for example. It's very difficult to hear what goes on outside a concrete room, yet the material is so dense that it absorbs no sound at all, instead reflecting it almost entirely. Thus, inside this concrete room, you get lots and lots of echo. All of that to say that the ideal material to reduce echo has good sound absorption and attenuation, but it's not too dense as to start reflecting sound back. And if you need a good laundry room, a basement with concrete walls is good, though echoey. We chose R13 fiberglass insulation for homes. We did not run any tests to know whether this was the best performing material for our needs, mostly because running a test for absorption is rather difficult. The tests you see a lot of other channels perform, not throwing shade at anyone, these are all great videos in their own right, but these sort of tests measure sound isolation, not necessarily absorption. We chose fiberglass because it's made of a material that's known to have good sound control properties. It's also the least dense option available, so in theory it'll have very little reflections. Plus, the price difference between this and the not proven for this application higher performing material is exponentially less, meaning we can cover a much larger area for the same price, which ironically, depending on your budget, would result in better performance to reduce echo. For example, two panels of the best sound absorbing material in the world would still not compare to 10 to 20 of these. As a reminder, this is very specific to our case and our space, and one of our priorities is price to performance. Last but not least, you'll want a way to cover the panels, for aesthetic purposes. Fiberglass is not the best thing to touch with your bare hands or inhale. The guy back there is covered with chiffon polyester. Cheap. Thin. Too thin. We had to double up the material for it to not be so sheer. We also tried tablecloths from Amazon and had some success. These navy blue ones look and feel great while being quite affordable. However, these white ones had a tighter knit and so the material is not breathable. So we want to make for a good covering as it does not let air carry the sound waves through, especially high-end frequencies. Looking elsewhere, although more expensive, we eventually found cotton muslin by the yard locally. Muslin is the more breathable material of the two, therefore it's better. However, it's harder to find in colors or even bleached. Though you could bleach it or dye it yourself. We tried this and it didn't work. It's also made of cotton, an organic fiber. In theory, over time the fabric is significantly more likely to stretch and lose its tension over the frame. The panels then would start to sag and look all bleh. When it comes to practice, I can't say for sure. Though we did make a few tests with this material, so maybe we'll report back in a few years, because I have a great track record of that. <laughs> if you're planning to print art on the cover, keep in mind that actually painting art on it would in fact seal the fibers and make the material more dense, and perhaps not breathable at all lowering the performance of the panel significantly. Same goes for any kind of vinyl heat pressing. The ideal way to decorate these panels then is buying something with a pre-made design on it 
doing some abstract thing with dice, screen printing, or what we did, sublimation. But this is a preferred method for printing a design onto the panels. The ink is transferred directly to the fabric by heat press, so it keeps the material breathable. We chose it because we already had the equipment required to sublimate. And while making large-ish prints is rather complicated, it's a lot easier and way cheaper than screen printing, even if we had the material required for that. If you watch our previous videos in this space, our weekly news every weekend, you might have noticed how bad the echo in here was. And the difference in this video with 10 panels covering about 35 square feet of our studio. It's a big improvement, but we still need to cover more of the empty walls and the vaulted ceiling. We didn't get to that at all. With that in mind, here's the obligatory sound test, before and after. Ah. Ah. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and join us next week. And don't forget to like and subscribe. Oh, I actually, wait, I actually never got to talk about the second use. We made uh, a panel board. And a negative fill. I didn't talk about this at all. And it has a little nubbin for... Wow, I should put more thought into writing these videos. <laughs> Let's get to building. The construction is pretty simple, but be sure to keep in mind these things before you start. Firstly, different tools equal different qualities. The miter saw is ideal for this one, but can be done with other types of saws. Although you may need to sand afterwards for more even cuts and joints. Secondly, we'll be working with fiberglass insulation and power tools, so using the appropriate protection is vitally important. Be sure to use a respirator, gloves, and goggles while working on this project. We'll be essentially making frames and wrapping a canvas, so we went out to our local big box store and picked up 8-foot MDF planks, braces for corner support, polyester cloth, utility backing cloth, and one roll of fiberglass insulation. At our disposal, we each had drills, gloves, masks, and screws, and wood glue for added support. You may need to go to the hardware store to supplement. Side note, we found better and cheaper resources on Amazon. We'll put the links in the description for what we found, but your mileage may vary. Okay. <gasps> <laughs> To begin, we started by cutting down all our MDF to size according to our pre-planned dimensions. We used clamps and Pablo supported a board at an end. We cut two planks at the same time, which helped us keep consistent cuts with such large panels at the beginning. We then lined up two planks and drilled pilot holes for a support screw. Wood glued each end together and glued the screw on for maximum support. This was likely strong enough to hold the frame together, especially if you don't plan to move it, ever. But just to be sure, we added brackets to all but the smaller octagons and triangles. The corner pieces were then drilled to allow for set brackets to join them on every corner. Remember to always drill the pilot holes or else risk splitting wood or the MDF. Rinse and repeat these steps till you get a pretty decent looking frame. Next, we moved on to the wrapping of the frame. Nails are fine for these falling steps, but a nail gun or a staple gun is preferable. A pneumatic one is even better, certainly to avoid hand soreness. Wink wink. We cut the polyester to size with enough excess to wrap around the edges and staple to the frame. We found that 4 inches of excess was ideal for handling. If you opted for tablecloths or something similar, you should also plan out how many panels you can cover with one tablecloth. If all the panels are one size, it's easy to fold the cloth into the number of panels and make the cut simultaneously. This gives you all the excess cloth you need while also minimizing waste. If you've ever wrapped a canvas before, you know the next steps. Some tips to keep in mind. Sharp scissors or a blade is one of the most important tools you need to continue. If you don't have a clamp or a fabric clamp, then a second pair of hands is recommended, but not needed if you're experienced. The method we found most effective to us was to staple one side of the canvas and match the staple points on the other with tension, and made our way inwards and finished by folding over each corner. Next came the insulation. We made our standard panels to fit the length and width and height of a strip of insulation, so nothing really fancy in the terms of techniques, but we do have tips. You want to remove the moisture barrier from the insulation to keep the air and sound particles moving. You also want to use a sharp blade to get even cuts. Be sure that the insulation fits snugly and that you don't compress it. Its structural integrity is vital to getting the best performance out of the panels. Once that is all done, you need to line the back of the panel with an equally breathable cloth to keep the insulation particles in and to keep the sound coming out. We use utility backing fabric found at our local fabric store. Nothing fancy about this either, just cut and staple. Finish it off with a nail hanger and the sound panels are all set. While this is definitely more than enough for some, we wanted to take the extra step and make them just a little bit more aesthetically pleasing. For some panels, we wanted to have a print on them, and since we already had the equipment for it, we used sublimation. This is our preferred method of printing a design onto the panels. The ink is transferred directly to the fabric by a heat press, so it keeps the material breathable. However, if the fabric is too thin, like it was for our test one, the transfer likely won't be successful. Ours ended with a faded look, but that's because that's how we meant to have it, right? Right. Now, while there are instructions as to how to effectively transfer an image, 
Like us, you might have to do some tests for the desired effect. But if done properly, you have infinite possibilities as to how to decorate your space. Just remember that you'll have to transfer the design first before stretching it onto the frame. Steps! To begin, cutting your cloth too short in order to try and save some cloth is definitely not worth it. A cloth that's just one inch too short can mean having to throw it all away and start over. We tried using L brackets for our tester frame, but found that we had to face the brackets outwards because you can't staple over metal. And staples in the corners are essential for a clean look when wrapping fabric. We recommend you do your own pricing research. For example, at a local hardware store, these boards with rounded edges were almost $2 cheaper than their sharp corner counterparts, though they also feel and look cheaper, but they won't be visible in the final product, so that's a win in my book. We found that the bigger and closer to a circle, the more surface area you can cover with less wood. For example, one 8-foot board can make two 16-inch triangles, one 16.5 by 33.5 rectangle or one octagon 30 inches in height. Bigger shapes are even more wood efficient, though you'll need more than one board to assemble them. We don't really recommend for a first-timer really trying them out. A miter saw becomes pretty much essential for angle cuts. However, if you are more experienced, here is a basic layout of the angles you need for a triangle or an octagon. Keep in mind you still want a good distribution of panels, not just one giant one. Space them out. Rectangles are the easiest shapes to work with for frame assembly, minimizing fabric waste and wrapping. All these steps are applicable to any size of paneling, though we do recommend you add a spine piece to support any type of insulation you choose for significantly larger frames. The point is that pre-planning can save you from having random wood waste and other headaches. If you'd like to see a further video on sublimation, let us know below. We'll be building more panels and sprucing up the space in the coming weeks. For some new and exciting things coming, be sure to like, subscribe, and stick around for those upcoming videos. Hope this helped. Subscribe. We have a subscribe sign. <laughs> subscribe. See that? That's our first test. It turned out all right. It turned out exactly how we wanted it to. Get way off my back about this.